Good evening all. I would invite you to turn your Bibles to the letter of Peter, 1 Peter. And we'll be reading chapter 1. 1 Peter, chapter 1. We will be reading from verses 3 to 5 for context. But today we are focusing on verse 5. So 1 Peter 1, verses 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. To hear the reading of the Lord's uh, word, it is infallible, inerrant, powerful to save. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let us pray once more. Father Lord, we have before us your living word. Mighty, powerful, like a double-edged sword cutting through flesh and marrow. I pray, Lord, that you would use me as your instrument this, today, this night, Lord, for your glory. And for the profit of your people, we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Last week morning, we saw how God makes us his children by the new birth. That was verses 3 to 4. And as children, we are promised an inheritance. And as we have inheritance... We are given a hope to that inheritance. Now, in verse 4, we are told that this inheritance is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and is kept secure in heaven for us. Now, what is that inheritance good for? What is it good that we have an inheritance, it is imperishable, it is guarded for us, kept for us, if we never get the inheritance, if we never get there. And that's what uh, we'll be concentrating on this evening. Anticipating that question, the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Peter here to answer that very question. How can we be sure we'll get the inheritance? So, the text before us in verse 5, I'll read again. You who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So the context here, the, the reference here is to a, a salvation. And it's a reference to a future salvation. Now, we usually talk about salvation as a past thing or a current thing. But less frequently, we talk about a salvation that is to come. We talk about a past salvation in the sense that we have been born again, that our sins are forgiven. We talk about a current salvation in the sense that we are being sanctified, we are being saved from our own sins, from the corruption of the flesh. And we also may talk about the current salvation, the present salvation, or being saved in the sense of we are going towards eternal life. But the sense here today, the focus on verse 5, is on the future salvation. A salvation that has not, in some sense, arrived yet. Christ has accomplished everything we need to a full and final salvation. But not everything has been fully realized or fulfilled yet. Last week we looked at the new birth. That's happened in the past, if you are born again. 
And uh, in it, we are given, even now, a new disposition to become holy like our Father is holy, as present. But we are still unable to reach full holiness. Because we are still having, we still have our fallen nature fighting against the Spirit. And in this sense, and much, much more, we are waiting, we are expecting, and we are promised a full salvation, a final salvation, a eternal life, ready to be revealed in the last time. We have the Holy Spirit teaching, guiding, and convicting us, but because we are still very much affected by sin, we are only able to profit from the Holy Spirit's teaching and guiding and convicting partially. Our learning, our wisdom, and our obedience is flawed by sin, even now. The Lord comforts us and gives us peace and joy, but we often neglect His comforting presence. Now, these and many other blessings, we are only able to taste in part. But we are promised that the day is coming where full, final, complete, eternal salvation will be revealed to us. And that's the type of salvation we are focusing on today, tonight. All blessings of heaven then, so the salvation there is all blessings of heaven, including final complete deliverance from sin and all of sin's effects on us. It's an eternal life of no sin, no death, no suffering, no grief and no pain. With eternal joy and satisfaction living with our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you have paid attention in last week's sermon, and you're still awake tonight's sermon, you notice that this salvation is the same as the inheritance we are looking at in verse 4. And that's exactly right. In verse 4, we are told that the salvation or the inheritance is in heaven. In verse 5, we are told it will be revealed in the last time. So verse 4, if you like, it's the geographic location. And verse 5 is the time or the timing that will be revealed to us. In verse 4, we are told that this inheritance or this salvation is kept secure. Now in verse 5, we are told that we are the ones kept secure for the salvation or the inheritance. So, let's move on. So we have this salvation. And the verse says that we are being guarded by God's power for this salvation. Guarded. We are being guarded by God's power. So, the guarding there is regarding our journey. So we are born again. Verse 3 and 4. We are born again caused by God Himself. We are born again, born anew, newly begotten into a new spiritual life. And then we are promised an eternal salvation in heaven. Now, between the new birth and eternity in heaven, there is a gap in history. There is maybe minutes, maybe decades of life between those two things. And what we are promised here is that God is guarding those who have started their journey to heaven from the new birth all the way to heaven. He is the one guarding them. Now, the word guarding there, um, it can have two meanings. Uh, and I believe both of them are at play here. It could be that he is guarding what you probably are thinking of is guarding from attacks. Like a city that has... Uh, barriers or uh, walls around and people guarding, you know, guards guarding the, 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 the towers around this city so that enemies would not flood in. And that's one of the senses of that. So guarding against attacks. But there is another one that might be surprising for you, which is this. He's guarding as a prisoner that wants to escape. Now you might be thinking, hmm, how does that work? We'll be looking into that later, but uh, think of it this way. Think of someone um, taking a path somewhere and then guards are placed beside him on the right on the left so that they don't go 
off rail. You could have a train going off rail or a, a, a carriage or a car going off track and getting lost. So we are guarded uh, that way as well. We'll be looking into how God guards us in a little, uh, in a little later. So first, though, I want us to ask this question. What are we guarded from? We're guarded. And we know that we are guarded for our salvation. Now, what is it that we, be, we are being guarded from? Think of what could possibly cause us to miss heaven, to miss the mark, to lose the inheritance. We are told that the inheritance is kept secure, so it couldn't be that the inheritance is going to get corrupt or fade away or be defiled or is going to be stolen. So it's not, the problem is not with the inheritance. What is it that could make us miss the inheritance, lose the inheritance? Christ paid the penalty for our sins. He achieved the righteousness in our place. We saw in previous sermons that God chose us and He is the one that caused us to be born again. So what could possibly make all of this frustrated? What could possibly make all of this God choosing, God begetting us anew, this promising of this inheritance, and in the end we'd never get there? Could it be death? Well, not really. Because death is the very means by which most of us will get there. If the Lord comes back before, we'll be changed in the blink of the eyes. So it's not death. It's not sin itself. Because if we say that if we sin, we lose the inheritance, then who of us could get the inheritance. He paid for our sins. So it couldn't be that. It couldn't be lack of obedience because who among us can say that we have perfect obedience and that's why we get into the salvation. That's what's guarding us, keeping us to the inheritance. Christ lived a perfect life in our place. So it couldn't be that because He's the one that achieved the perfect Holiness necessary for us to get the inheritance. What is it that could make us lose eternal life? I think the answer is obvious. It is faith. It is faith. Faith, when the devil attacks us, when the devil tempts us, it is faith that he is after. It's faith that he's trying to attack. When he's attempting us to sin, faith, to lose our faith, to mistrust our God, to lose our confidence and affection for our Savior is what he is after. The curse of sin it still affects us. It affects us even in our physical health. Our sinful nature still causes us to fall into temptation and disobey. It's losing our faith when tempted, when sinning, when attacked that is the problem here. We would be disqualified from the inheritance if we lost our faith. It's forsaking our Lord. It's leaving the narrow path altogether. So faithlessness and unbelief is what the devil is after. We've, it's what the world is tempting us to. It's what our fallen nature still fights us for, so that we are guarded, therefore, from losing faith. That's what we are guarded from, from unbelief, from losing faith altogether. So, we have our salvation promised to us. We have God's power guarding us so to make sure that we get that salvation. But now let's consider how he guards us. How are we guarded? Before we get there, let me give you two illustrations of how we are not guarded so that we get to the inheritance, to the salvation. God could have guarded us by shielding us from any sort of attack. God could 
try to protect us or, you know, guard us, protect us by shooting us. Shooting us from anything that might disqualify us from getting into heaven. Like a child that is shielded from the world. Think of a child in the countryside somewhere, in a house where they have no contact with the outside world. No friends visiting, no TV, no internet, no radio, no one visiting the house because the parents are afraid that the child might be influenced by the outside world. That could be one way God was guarding us, but that's not how He guards us. We still pass through suffering, pain, and trial. We, he could have shielded us altogether from experiencing any sort of suffering, any sort of injustice, any sort of disappointment. He could have guarded us from ever being tempted to sin. He could have guarded us from ever seeing, hearing, or feeling any sort of influence to sin. He could have made sure that all we would ever ever we would ever hear or see or think would be wholesome and edifying. But that's not how he guards us. Second way he doesn't guard us. He doesn't guard us by arresting us so we never escape. Think of that child, right? The child is protected from the outside world. But imagine the child says, I don't care for this. I want to go out. I'm going to go to the world. And the world is going to kill the child or, you know, it's going to take the child away or abuse the child. So the parents are scared for the child's safety. What do they do? They lock the child in their bedroom for the rest of their young life. So the child is locked away. They will every now and then pass a tray of food under the door and make sure that the windows are blocked, boarded up, so the child has no way of escaping. God could have done something similar. He could have, you know, made sure that we would never be able to escape from faith. He would ever, you know, like think of a horse. Have you seen the horses when they're riding this, uh, they're pulling this uh, 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 carts, they have this blindfold thing, they have, they call it uh, masks, um, and the horse, all the horse can see is what is in front of it, because they don't want the horse to suffer distraction from what's around the horse. Yeah? So God could have guarded us in some sense in the same way. He could have put guard around our eyes, so all we could see is heaven. I can't see any temptation. I can't see any trouble. I cannot see any trials around me. All I can see is the way, the narrow path to heaven. Then you might say, well, what about the horse or us, you know, turning our head? Well, maybe we'd turn our head and God would, you know, pull the ring and whip us in the back and say, just look straight. That's not how he guards us. That's not how he guards us. He could have locked us up. He could have forced us to stay on the narrow way. He could have made sure that we would follow the path even if we didn't like it. Even if we didn't actually want to get to heaven. But that's not how he guards us. So then, how does God guard us? Look at the text. Through faith. Verse 5 again. Who by God's power, so God's power, are being guarded... Through faith for a salvation. So it is faith. God's very power is guarding us to salvation. And the way He's guarding us is through faith. He's guarding us from what would disqualify us from getting our inheritance, our salvation. How is He doing that? By providing the very means to get the inheritance, the salvation. We lose our faith, we lose our eternal life. And if it was up to us to guard our faith, we would lose it in the next minute. Apart from God's sustaining work, we would go back to our own vomit, like the prophet says. We'd go back to following the world, the devil, and the flesh. Matthew 24, verse 13 says this, But the one who endures to the end 
will be saved. The one who endures to the end will be saved. So, are being guarded. In the original there, it's a constant guarding. It gives the sense that you, you, if you are born again, are being guarded by God continually. So if the one who endures and perseveres to the end is the one that's going to be saved, here God is the one causing us to persevere to the end. He is continually guarding us from our new birth to heaven all the way through. So, notice though, the human responsibility part of it. It is God guarding, but it's us having faith and acting on this faith. Notice how the means of salvation is achieved by God alone, right? God is the one who chose us, verse 1. God is the one who born, uh, made us, caused us to be born again, verse 3, through the work of Jesus Christ, verse 3. He is the one that promised us, verse 4, the inheritance. He is the one who promised us the salvation, verse 5. He is the one keeping the inheritance. He is the one keeping us. It is God from start to finish. However, He is respecting our responsibility and our will. Faith is exerted by ourselves. We really believe. It's, it's really us. We really choose. We really follow Him. We really decide to go to Him. We really decide to accept the gospel message. But it is granted by God Himself. So that we are the ones doing it, but God is the one enabling it, you see? Philippians 2, 12 to 13 says this, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So it's us working out hard at work to be remaining faithful, to persevere to the end, even through trials. Then it continues, verse 13. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for His pleasure. It is us, but it is God for us. Consider this illustration. Sometimes we think of salvation or sovereign salvation in, in a sense, in this sense, a blind man in a burning building. Imagine there is a burning building and this blind man does not see the fire, okay? And he really loves the place he is at and he is really enjoying his time there. It's even a bit warm, so he likes it. Now, we imagine salvation as, you know, the eternal hell, eternal fire, fire in the building, if you didn't notice. Um, we imagine this blind man being dragged across the room and thrown out of the building, saying, you know, he's really trying to stay inside the building. He's really trying to stay there. He's really saying, kicking and screaming, saying, I don't want to leave the room. And they're saying, it's in fi on fire. And he says, no, I want to stay. And they're kicking, you know, he's kicking and screaming. And they're dragging him and throwing him outside the building. That's not how God saves us. It's much more of opening the eyes of this blind man so he sees there is a fire and he himself runs away. Not before he starts to persuade others to run away from the fire as well. So, like a, um, so the human responsibility. God gives us sight. He's the one giving us sight to see the danger. So that when we see the danger, we ourselves act on that faith. So God gives us the faith. He gives us a new heart. gives us the faith. And we act. But it is Him through us. So, to think of the previous illustrations of the, 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 the child trying to run away from the parents' protection, the right thinking, the right way of thinking of salvation would be that the child understands that the best way to be, the most the secure and safe place to be, is in the parents' house. 
So he will never want to leave. Or the horse trying to look, you know, going to the left and going to the right. Instead of doing that, they just put guards or masks so he can't even see where to look at. In our case, true God's salvation is by showing the horse, if you want. How many times have you been uh, called a horse from the pulpit? But it's showing the horse that the best way to run is in this tract. And is the, the, the destination is the best thing for him. So he won't be distracted. He won't want to go to the left or to the right. He will see the final destination and will focus on that. And that's more like how saves us. He gives us faith and he makes sure that faith is never lost to the end. Now, I want us to realize that this faith is a supernatural faith. This faith is not something we can make up, we can create. We need God giving this to us. In verse 6 and 7, he is going to talk about, well, in the following verses, he's going to talk about what genuine faith looks like. Lord willing, one day we'll get there. And then later on, he's going to say, talk about what's required from those who are to be faithful. So verse 6 and 7, he says, that genuine faith is faith that perseveres through testing. Like a gold is tested by fire, our faith is tested. The genuineness of our faith is tested by trials. Verse 8, he'll say that faith that saves is a faith that produces love and inexpressible joy. In someone we never seen, Jesus Christ. So this faith is a faith that has inexpressible joy for someone we never even seen in real life. In verse 14 and 15, we are told that we are to be obedient, like obedient children, holy in all our conduct. Verse 22, it says, we must love others earnestly from a pure heart. In chapter 2, verse 1, it says, put away all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, all envy, and all slander. So we might think before these things, I'm not sure I'm going to get there. I'm not sure my face is strong enough. I'm not sure I'm going to make it. Trials like fire? I'm not sure I can make it. A holy conduct from here to the time I get to heaven? I'm not sure I'm able. And that's the very point he's trying to make. We are not able. If you try with your own strength, in your human nature, in your human will, to exert this faith, to guard this faith, you will fail. We need a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit sustaining this faith and giving us grace so that we can endure through any sort of trial, any sort of temptation. Peter himself must have been anxious about this because in John 21, 18, he says this, truly, truly, this is the Lord Jesus talking, uh, saying to Peter, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This is probably a reference to the type of death that Peter would suffer. Tradition is not in the Bible. We don't know for sure. But tradition says that he was crucified upside down. So he must have been anxious that, am I going to make it? Am I going to remain faithful before crucifixion? I mean, a servant girl was able to make him deny his Lord for three times. How about crucifixion? Friends, the very point is this. Faith that endures that perseveres to the end, 
is a supernatural faith given by God Himself. Now, how? It's through faith. How are we... Um, sorry. Through faith. In conclusion then, and then an application. God will accomplish it. Verse 5 again says, For a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So, if God's power is guarding us for a salvation, and if this salvation is going to be revealed only in the last time, it must therefore be that God will guard us from the beginning to the end. If He is the one guarding it, and if the salvation is only coming after the end of our lives, therefore we can have confidence that He is the one that is going to make it sure that we will remain to the end. You persevere to the end. The very purpose of God's guarding is to bring us to full salvation. Then it is clear that God will accomplish His purposes. They will, or we will in fact, receive the final salvation. Our salvation ultimately depends on God's own power, but His power works through faith. So, last week we saw how we have a never-dying hope, a never-dying Savior, a never-dying inheritance. And tonight we see that God's power gives us a never-dying faith for a never-dying salvation in the last time. Consider then a few applications, points of application. Continuous faith is necessary for salvation. Notice the condition to salvation. He is guarding us through faith. So those who are being guarded are the same ones that have been born again in verse 3. So all of those who have been born again in verse 3 are the ones that God Himself is guarding in verse 5 for their salvation. So if we say that we have been born again, but do not have true saving faith, we are liars or we are deceived. If we say we have an eternal hope, but we are not believing now, we have a false hope. Faith is the necessary fruit of the new birth. All of those who have been born again to salvation are being guarded by God through faith. Notice that this faith is not a once-in-a-lifetime faith. It's a continuous faith. Between the new birth and heaven, there is years of living. Yes? If we are going to be guarded through faith, it means that the moment we don't have faith, we lose our faith, we lose our trust, our confidence in the Lord, we fail and we don't get to heaven. We don't get to the inheritance. Now, what we are being promised is that we will not fail. That though we may stumble, we will be restored like Peter was. And he will make sure we get there. So, do you want to be saved? Believe and trust in Jesus Christ as your only Lord, Savior, and the ultimate desire of your life. Do you want to know if you are saved? If you're truly trusting in Jesus as the master of your soul now, and your delight is in Him, then God's power is guarding you through that very faith. Do you want to know if you'll be kept to the end? Well, if you have true faith now, God's power will make sure you have true faith tomorrow and tomorrow until the day you get to heaven. Notice, lastly, the centrality of God in our redemption. He is to be praised. In verse 3, it's by His great mercy that we have been born again. In verse 3, it's Him who caused us to be born again. In verse 3, it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ that gives us hope. Verse 4, it is Him who keeps our inheritance. In verse 5, it's Him who guards us through faith, and that faith is given by Himself. Jude 24, 25 says, Now, to Him 
who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of His glory and great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory and majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. May the Lord bless you.